Hi guys, welcome to the Incredible Hulk podcast. And we are talking. Hello. <laughs> and we are talking. Yeah, yeah, that was the, that was the tones of Susan there. We'll get on to those two in a minute. Uh, yeah, we're talking about the season two story, Escape from Los Santos. I oh, guess. Um, which starred, of course, Bill Bixby as Dr. David Banner, Lou Ferrigno as the Incredible Hulk, co-starring Shelley Fabars as Holly Cooper, Dana Elkar as Sheriff Harris, a little a short guy, W.K. Stratton as Deputy Monroe, Vernon Nettle as Chase, the attorney, and, as a matter of interest to you holsters out there, Lee DeBrew, who played Mike Evans, the cop, the twisted cop, who I have an interview with at the end of this podcast. So please stick around for that to hear me talking to Ian LeBrew. Lee LeBrew, sorry. <laughs> yes. Okay. Right. right, we're off. Starters plot, starters all this. Um, we begin with um, a police kind of uh, chase thing going on, it seems. Uh, down this sort of dusty highway thing. Um, And this Mexican family, I believe, um, are down sort of on the, the, uh, um, parked over, and they're observing this. And then you see David coming along. He's he's walking, you know, obviously on his hitchhiking. And he's observing this, this, all this chaos. And um, anyway, he takes a break, has a little sit down for a while. Little time passes again, the thing goes by again, and he sees um, this woman in the back of the car sort of staring back at him. And, uh, and he's thinking, What the hell's going on here? All this, all this activity carries on walking anyway. And behind him is this strolling slowly behind him is this cop car, right? It's just pacing him. Dun, dun, dun. And, and you can see David getting agitated, so why doesn't he just go, why won't he pass me? You know, <laughs> you know keep going, and, and he won't. And, uh, uh, and there's a wonderful line where David, it, pull, it pulls up, and of course the character that we're talking about is in, uh, is Lee LeBrew, LeBrew, Mike Evans, who's driving the car, one of the, the cops. And uh, David says this wonderful line, he goes, what's the problem, officer, was I speeding? <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh! Yeah. So he, he kind of finds he, he, the cop finds it quite amusing, and uh, yeah, found a little bit of humor there. Yeah, right before right before the trouble started, because yeah. that Did guy he, that guy wouldn't let him alone. He wouldn't he wouldn't leave him alone. No, he definitely wanted to. You know, yeah, he, he was he, he he wasn't taking no for an answer, was he? Because David no. just said, like, "I'm this one. I'm I'm going. I'm heading to wherever he's at. I can't remember exactly where he was going to." Uh, Phoenix or something, I think. Um, so, oh, and and the, the officer said, no, don't go to this hotel. Or he said, first of all, I'll take you to the hotel in town. And then he said, and, and David's like, oh, there's one. I want to go see. I want to go there. And the officer's like, uh-uh, not going to drop you off there. And he's like, he's like, no, there's one right by the police station. Yeah. And David's like, oh, fine. So he goes to the oh, and he says it's cheaper and it's and it's cleaner. Yes. And he he goes to the police station and there's no hotel around and he's like, what 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 do you want about? What are you doing? And Dave and to go, the officer wrestles him into the the police station, offers him coffee and stuff, and then he says, no no no, I don't really want any. Um, I'll just be on my way. And the officer says, nope. And then all of his buddies come and they push him into the cell and stuff. And then he's sitting there and he's like, what the heck? I want my phone call. Yeah. And then the girl that's in the cell next to him, the the woman that was in the car. Um, Yeah, she was... She was in the, the cell next to him, and he's like, what is going on here? First I saw you in the back of a cop car, and then I'm pushed in here. And then they're like, yep, you're under arrest for the murder because they just kind of 
started talking sideways and they said you're under the arrest you're under arrest for the murder of of this woman's husband and and she she looks distraught like like she's like they've been trying to pin it on her all day yeah anyway and they they they, they escort her out don't they they say yeah. come, come with us something yeah once once they arrested they david had, they had somebody to pin it on and so yeah and they, they, oh yeah they said they found confession uh confession letters in his bag and all that love letters and all this stuff yeah you know which wasn't true at all you know so they're framing him um they're, yes, that's, they're, corrupt. they're corrupt yeah um, that's definitely the, the case and then he's like um he's like no 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 and so he he gets frustrated with the guy and with the guard and the, and he grabs the guard and he says and and the guard i don't remember what they said they said but the guard pushes him and then maces him yes he maces him right in the eyes yeah um and that's all she wrote yeah so indeed uh, um so he goes writhing in agony in the corner and yeah. the guy who maced him was lee de brew <laughs> actually yeah uh, yeah. But he, he he goes out. He goes. That should keep calming down for a while. Wrong. <laughs> That's going to do the opposite. That's going to get him very very angry. Right, right, right. <laughs> um, and, and you wouldn't uh, like him when he's angry. And they won't like him. No, that's right. And they didn't. Yeah. So anyway, he goes out, and of course, that's when the moment happens when he changes. David changes in the cell, and the little guy come back. Uh, um, uh, Sheriff Harris, played by Dana Elkar bald-headed guy he's been in so much stuff all the noise in here he he was in so many so many so many tv tv movies in the 70s he was everywhere yeah Yeah. in baba black sheep he was the the captain in the first season of beretta uh i I just knew his face but i couldn't recall where from but you had that you know you know when you know so uh, you see a recognizable face but you can't quite yeah, they said they have. Well, because he he was a character actor. A lot yeah. of a lot of uh, there's a lot of character actors that an have lot. been around yeah. or they died recently. Uh, but yeah, he was in Beretta. He was in Baba Black Sheep. He was in a lot of uh, a lot of stuff. Yeah, when I was looking up the the cast list for this, he he died in 2005. That actor, wow. not, me, not me, mega mega long ago, but you know, um, yeah. Um, so anyway, he comes in to see what the disruption is, <laughs> and he's met by the Hulk <laughs> in the cell. What the hell is? This? And and, he, and and the Hulk p- picks up the the cell door and picks him up and, with it. <laughs> and just kind of pushes, yeah, lifts him up and just kind of pushes him into the wall and yeah. like leaves him there. Just leaves him there. Like, Can you stay there, mate? Don't move. Yeah. And uh, so he wasn't moving anyway. He was terrified. <laughs> He's not going anywhere. Um, and the Hulk breaks through the wall, so we've got to break out straight away now. Because they're trying to get the girl, and the girl's struggling, you know, into the car. So he sorts yep. out the two guys and just flops, flops them like flies across the bonnet of the car and all that, you know, over the, over the hood of the car, and gets her out of there. And then you get that little classic moment where you always get these little extra scenes of the Hulk sometimes. Where you got this couple, you know, in the woods, um, sort of to a romantic couple, you know, and he's the night is young, as they say, and you know, and all this stuff, and he's getting a little bit hot under the collar, the boyfriend, and he's um, and all that, and uh, there's a bit of that going on, and uh, she goes, I heard something, there's some noise out there. He says, Ah, no, you're mentioning it. Come on, so if you keep putting it off and all this, it is a bit, it's frustration of youth, you know. And, um, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and so, so he, but she's not right. She's adamant. There's something, you know, there's no, there's something out there. And of course there is, they put the lights on, flick the headlights on. And, the, and, the there standing there with the, and they probably thought that they saw it had a Bigfoot sighting or something, <laughs> you know, a green one, obviously. But I mean, they probably thought bloody hell, man, it's the, the stories are true, you know? Anyway, they, they, take off, they take off like a rocket out of there. 
And the Hulk's just like, really what he was trying to do is, as you saw in that shot, was he was trying to get them to help her. You know, he, he, he was coming over and with her, he was holding her and he was sort of bringing them, bringing her forward to them. Like, so can you, can you take her to a hospital or help with something? something. It, it seemed as if he was asking for their help, but they weren't having it. <laughs> no, they were way they too were hauling, scared. They were hauling the ass, they say, yeah. So they're yeah. out there, yeah. And then you get the trans. He takes her and, and the transition back to David. David gets her back. He, 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 he takes her out of there somewhere. I can't remember exactly where they're going now. Oh yes, that's right. Um, come in any time, guys. By the way. <laughs> um, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, um, he takes them to. He takes it was the Mexican group, wasn't it? Her the to the, the the yeah the family. Yeah. And then, uh, and then they, they, he tries to get him smuggled out of uh, out of Los Ga Los. What is it, Los? Los Altos? Santos. Los Santos, and yeah. so yeah, um, uh, camp where the the Mexican family were. We were kind of helping them and getting them changing clothes. They were the changing clothes. Obviously, he broke out of his last lot. This kind of thing. And um, then they work out how far they have to go. They have to go on quite a lot of a journey to get to the house. That you know, the house. I think it's about ten miles away or something. Ten miles, yeah. So they and they have to do it on foot. Um, so they get going early in the morning, I think. And so you know, this, that, and the other, and. Uh, um, they make it. No, they get to. Let me think now. No, they go to a friend of theirs, don't they? A friend of hers, rather. Who was a friend of the husband and everything, trying to get help. And he only opens the window to them. Right. He doesn't want to know, basically. He's saying, Look, I can't help you. I'm not getting involved in this. But like, can we use your phone? No, it's, it's, it's out of order. So um, both, both, of, both of the. The people, the couple who lived in that house, like, yeah. you know, basically shut them out. They shut them out, and so they, they said, right, where's, um, uh, so they go off anyway, and um, I think this is the bit where they find, they get back to her, I think they get back to her house, or the husband, or the, you know, her, her, her place. Yes. After that. And and, and they, they find, know. they find the, the wedding, the the wedding al album, yeah. and, and in there, there there's yeah. some negatives. Yeah, because uh, they saw that the they saw somebody carrying the case out of their ha the house just as they showed up, and she was like, "Oh no, that's it. The that's the end of this." Because they've been in there. So, and they, the forensics have been in there. You can see the place was tipped upside down in there and messed up and everything. When they yeah, so they'd already been in trouble. It's what amazes me is that if they found that place for evidence, how come they never found that? She found it straight away, which is on the table, in a book. Oh, because it was it was mixed in with wedding photos, negatives. Right. Yeah, I'm just yeah, I was just curious why they didn't spot that, but. Um, because it was the wedding. People don't usually keep you know, evidence in a wedding album, they keep it in a separate locked file. Yeah, yeah. Like what they drug out earlier. So all the evidence that was in that file, though, had been photographed on these microfiche, and so they had they had all the evidence there. That's right, yeah. So they got that, they, they, they got that, and they put it in, they, they, they packed it all into a little, you know, a little uh, envelope. And, yep. and, then, and then they went, then they went walking off, Trying to get the car in the, back the, the car was in the garage, wasn't it? So they, oh yeah, yeah, the, the husband's car. So they were going to get drive out and get that, you know. So they had some because they still had some miles to go to get take this evidence to this other guy. Uh, blah blah blah. <laughs> so just as they're pulling out, Lee Debru is pulling in, <laughs> you know, the sheriff, right, right, uh, and blocks them. Uh, um, so he, he, he obviously got, he obviously it wasn't far away or he got a tip off again or something, I don't know, but he came back there and caught them right in the act. And this bit, this bit's really good though, Sue, isn't it? The, the, the bit, David really does show his metal here, doesn't he? 
out yeah. of state, the desperation. He really does go full. He really does go the full hog. It's quite a little bit. He's very heroic in this, actually. In this one, you think about it, he's so desperate to clear his name and help her. He, got, he resorts to like breaking a few laws while he does it. You know, um, like assaulting a police officer, for instance. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and all that stuff. You know, um, yeah, it's quite a different little side of him in this one. Um, so what's good in this is that the the the, the uh, um, when he blocks them, he gets out of the car, hands up and all that, and they've got the car door, their, their car door open, uh, and uh, um, or a truck or whatever, it, yeah, whatever it was, uh, and um, he David sneakily passes the envelope to 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 uh, Holly. She puts it into the into the car, you know, on the seat. To try and hopefully you won't see it. Um, and he's aiming the gun at them from, you know, blah, blah, blah. And he, that's when he handcuffs them both together, both that one army, you know. Oh, yeah, yeah. So they're locked together with one arm each. That's, that's another sort of problem they have. And um, But David's really good on his feet here. He really becomes a man of action because he, 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 he whacks him, throws him to the ground, gets her in the, her in the car, you know, and uh, off they go. And they go... Sp- they go through a few. They go through bollards and smash through the, you know, all that, all that stuff. The block. The, and, and, and they keep cutting to his, his and her hands. Yes. Handcuffed together using the gear shift. That's right. He says, "Yeah, you got." Uh, I'm having. Pro-. She said, "It's hurting me." So he said, "Put your hand on top of mine, and we'll we'll coordinate." So they manage it, but it's awkward. But you know, you hear like the, the gear stick crunching away, <laughs> and yeah. all that. But it's really good because that's when all sort of the action starts. Really, there's like loads of car chases going on, and he's David's really on the mission, you know. And uh, it's, it's really like action hero time for David Banner here. You know? Yeah, <laughs> I mean, he, he even does the the whole Indiana Jones crossing the gorge on a on a wire thing. Oh yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah. That's, that's like a bit. Yeah, that's coming up. Yeah, but the the police, the police. Um, oh yeah, that's right. Because um. <laughs> The cops, as, as they fly off, the cops ring up uh, uh, um, uh, Mike Evans on the uh, police radio and say, "You still with them? Or you got them? You got them?" He goes, "Well, it's like this, or something like this." <laughs> Oops, uh, oh no, you know, how am I going to tell them that they got away? <laughs> um, so he's kind of like the, he's a bit dishevelled and, and upset. So they can off, <laughs> and it's. Yeah, there's a real action stunt here. Like, you know, bloody hell, David is unbelievable in this. Because the, the, the cops are coming after and they're doing like, it's a bit like the smoking the bandit chases, you know, where they outwit the stupid cops. <laughs> yeah. So get out of the way and the, and the cop car is flying off and falls in a ditch and, and they sort of turn back and sort of smile and that, you know, he's sort of, David's sort of them. Um, but this bit is good, Sue, because this is the bit where... Um, they get, they get, to, they finally get to the attorney's house. Yeah. But he was a friend. He was a, he, I think he was the husband's attorney, wasn't he, or something? The guy. Yeah. Uh, um, oh, he was. He was the district friends. attorney. Yeah. And they have all the. They got obviously got the evidence with them, and they want. They want him to at least listen to them. So yeah. they Get a fair trial. If you, if you just hear us out, then maybe you can help us. You know. Yeah. Sure. That kind of thing. Unfortunately, he uh, he doesn't do what he says, does he? No, no, he he's crooked as the day is long, and he, he says, "Right, go go go, go, go and get um, whatever you know, get because their car un- unknowingly t- at that point, their car, uh, the, the valet that he has, or whatever, the helper has m- moved their car away, so they can't <laughs> use the car to escape." So that he's been planning that already, as soon as they arrive, more or less. Um, he says, we'll be back in a minute. I'll be back in a minute. And then they see him doing the phone call. And they see the box. That's right. Behind him is a box with the evidence. Yeah, that was the box that, that they saw in the, that they saw it coming out of her, her house yes, earlier. That's right. Yeah, that's right. And, and, you know. So he's put two and two together straight away, David. He goes, ah, oh, shit, he's on to us. You know? Yeah, and the envelope. And they and they and they leg it. 
Well, I mean, this show is somewhat realistic, I suppose, in terms of the scenario. Of course, they don't really cover the cops or the town. So some of the motivations, again, you don't really know. Uh, of course, they do show it through the episode. But, um, I mean, as much as I like The Incredible Hulk, uh, the TV version was a lot more The Fugitive. Oh, yeah. So I don't know if they were doing a little bit of an in-joke as to the, you know, fugitives or the bold ones or whatever, because there was a couple of movies that they had, which, of course, was slightly different, where they had, you know, a black man and a white man uh, handcuffed together. Yeah. I think oh, yeah. it was the Defiant Ones, I think it was. Oh, yeah. Um, That's right. So, but, then, but, I mean, not, the, yeah. the, but not in this the case. Fugitive exactly. was a, the Fugitive was always a, 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 yeah. the main focus of the story because that was yeah. McGee and Banner. That was the Fugitive thing. Right. You know, rather than well, the, and so, I mean, it was realistic in the sense that, you know, it wasn't totally stereotypical, but at the same point, you still had a little bit of the 70s genre of, you know, I'm fighting the law and will I win against it and all that stuff. Um, I guess the other issues were um, the kind of sarcastic humor in the episode, the fact that the, um, you know, when he metamorphosizes, they forgot about the fact that it's a totally different shirt than what he was wearing. Yes, that's right. <laughs> uh, when he hulks out again. And he's holding the the woman. I guess they were in a movie together in the '60s. Um, but I know that Bill Bixby was in a couple of movies with Elvis Presley. He was. Uh, so he that's not an, yet. Yeah, so that's another funny thing. Um, uh, you can see possibly, you know, again, the rocks don't really look realistic or heavy, and the um, you can see some of the safety harnesses and the trucks may have had some signs showing for just a second. Yeah. But again, you know, this is the seventies and this is also the era where they had, you know, anywhere from 20 to 30 episodes as opposed to oh, yeah. a lot. now where, you know, 2018, you'd be lucky if you get 15 and mm -hmm. you'd be lucky if it doesn't get canceled. They were doing, uh, maybe, they were doing, you know, from the second season on, they, they, not, they were, they were averaging maybe 22, 24 episodes. A season. Yeah. So, so it's an I mean, awful lot to do. It's an awful lot. Yeah, so I mean, considering that in a way they're trying to do realistic and fantasy and put in a comic book, and they did have a lot of makeup where they showed him, you know, Bill Bixby transferring to Lou Ferrigno and vice versa. Yeah. Whereas opposed in a lot of episodes they didn't, or they had one episode, I think we reviewed it, where the... Um, you know, McGee didn't realize that he was right in front of uh, David Banner as he was, you know, reverting back to, to human. But, uh, yeah, so for the, yeah, this is a lot, actually, because he, I think he hulks out, what, three times? Three or four times? In this, you mean? Yeah, in this episode, because, well, he got maced. Yeah, that's the first and one. And the other time... All this, all this stuff is happening in between, you know, where he was trying to... This time he hulks out because... Um, yes, yeah, a bit because they're giving chase now. They're giving chase, and they they got the um, they're, so they, they they've got no vehicle again. They're on the on foot. They're handcuffed together, and um, they make it to this like, huge, as you just said, this huge kind of um, what do you chasm. Call it? What do you call it? Those big, those big, what they call what, the, support the support bridge, bridge? The support Foot bridge thing. Yeah, it goes right over one side of the mountain to the other kind of thing, yeah. and it's ropes, isn't it? That you yeah. pull yourself along on. And it's just got very, not the strongest, wooden steps on it. No, it doesn't have steps. It's got wires. It's three wires, okay. one on top and two, or one on the bottom and two on top. And they're, they're holding on and they're, they're going side to side, hand over hand on, on the wires yeah, going so across. Very, 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 very scary stuff. Which is hard when you're handcuffed together with somebody. Yes. It's hard also, enough. Without handcuffs, I can't. I couldn't imagine doing it myself with you know balance. It's scary because you're looking at you know below like sheer drop, you know. Yeah, and then and then they get to the other side. Oh and yeah, the, and they're the cornered, start, they're cornered, aren't they? By the cops one side and. Yeah, the cops start shaking it, and he falls off, and she falls off. She and, falls through. She falls through. A foot goes through. Um, 
Yeah. And she thought she's hanging and he's, he's only got the one arm to hold her. And um, obviously so they're because- cranking up because the, the, they, they've got their search dogs out, you know, the bloodhounds and they've got their, all that going on and the noise and stress. And he's desperately trying to hold her so she doesn't fall. And it triggers, his, so- triggers the whole cow. Yeah. So he hulks out and he yeah. turns in and he turns and because she's hanging over the, the side, she doesn't see it. And because the cops are, are sort of d- distracted, they, they don't have a clean line of sight to him. They don't see it. Yeah. But for like, a it, it's a, it's a, it's dramatic. I mean, once he's once he's hulked out, he, he breaks through the the handcuffs, and he and he pulls her out. He pulls her out, and he pulls her out, and he sets her down. And the envelope's there, and he and you know, it's like the Hulk has forgotten the envelope. Yeah, and it's like she is so traumatized; she's not going to be able to remember the envelope. So he he ends up like carrying her and stuff. But he, he um. I like the bit where he um, he obviously turns back to sort of give them a bit of a fright. Oh, you know, the, yeah, and the cops start c- crossing. They're and coming then they across, think, yeah. And, and so he, the Hulk shakes, shakes the, the the bridge and collapses the, the his end of the bridge. Yeah, and the, on itself, yeah. And the cops shimmy their way back to the other side really quick. Yeah, because there's no way they can get across there now. Yeah. Wrecked half of it. Yeah. So they've got a long way to go back, you know, because they're the other side of the bloody thing, peak. So they have to go a long way around to get to them again. But what's intriguing here is it's an interesting camera work after this, too, because they've got the. Um, it's, it looks like a handheld shot because it's all kind of wobbly. Yeah. I'm sure it's kind of it's just kind of odd where you see, they can see David's feet coming along after these chains back. Yeah, no, that, that that's what I mean, too, is that I don't know if they were trying to make it, you know, very realistic, but disorienting for the for the viewer, you know, well, trying to shake him up. When he was looking over, you could see David looking over the ridge. I think he thought, because he blacks out, obviously, when he becomes the Hulk. I think for a moment he thought that she died. Because he's looking over the ridge. And it's well, the, the, the funny the thing is, I mean, after, yeah, after he's, you know, after they're done with that, I mean, she's really scared of him, and he and she's actually throwing rocks at him, and he seems, you know, very confused. You know, that she's going, get away from me, get away from me, you know? Yeah, but, but what's interesting is when he's back to normal, yeah. that, that bit I was saying about, you know, the, 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 the ominous, just that moment of om- ominous bit, the way he... I think he he just thought, may have thought for a moment that she fell to her death when he hopped, you know, when he blacked out before he became the Hulk. Um, but then you hear her call over to him, David, and he turns around and he's with the Mexican family again. She's got the evidence. I think she says, you know, she shows him the thing. Um, and uh, he is, uh, he and she are, you don't know really where they are. You assume they're somewhere in the truck. And um, it turns out uh, there's a roadblock ahead. So they go up to the roadblock and they're like, they're like, um, the the father says, now be cool. I'll do all the talking. And, and then the, the cop was so racist. He was like, he called him a wetback, and it was just awful what he said. And that's pretty timely for what's going on w- over here in the States with, you know, st- a star calling people racist things. Anyway, um, so so there is like this cop, the cop calls them this name and then and then demands to see their green cards, and so the two sons produce the green cards and then produces a, a, a driver's license and tells them, listen, buzz off officer. I'm from Denver. Yes, and yes, yes. so, <clears throat> so the officer kind of lets him go, but like says, I don't ever want to see you here, which is ridiculous because their house is there. 
Anyway, so. But what was interesting about the, the when he was re- reverting back to David from the Hulk, he it was just a like you guys said, it was a super tight shot on his face. And you could actually see the metamorphosis. They they like perfected that that look. I don't know. It was amazing to me. Yeah, because when they did that, when they were doing those that, that transition, when every now they wouldn't show it all the time, but sometimes they would show that transition of Bill in different stages of makeup, you know. Um, so you'd have to be made up a bit like Lou's face. Uh, yeah. The green, the green makeup, the big eyebrows, the nose, the contacts, in a couple of different stages of makeup. And then they would kind of like try and mix them together to change, you know. Yeah. I used to like it when they did that, actually. It was quite intriguing. But, um, it never quite matched up, sadly, though, because they didn't ever get like the... the they didn't they often get the transition right, you know, but that's what they were dealing with back. That's the resources they had back then in the seventies, you know, they didn't have CGI or anything like that. So yeah. So all in all, so, uh, guys, I thought I liked this because I thought I liked it. For, there was a couple of standout moments for me, really. I loved the scene at the beginning with the tension in the cell building up to the whole count. I thought that was great. Yeah. Banners sort of, uh, you know, despera- uh, confusion and desperation. What the hell is going on here? You know, he was trying to get answers. It was just like cranking up this tension. You know what's going to happen. You could see the pe- you could see the Hulk coming. You know, I love that kind of build up. That, I, so I thought that scene was really good. Um, and I liked the way he worked. He, he, the camaraderie between him and Holly, I thought, was very good as well. Yeah. Um, they worked really well together on on the run together. I thought that was good. Yeah. Um, <laughs> And, and there, those, the, those moments of the hands shifting the gears was yeah. pretty cool. And, and, and just the, the action, action David, you know. Indiana Re- Jones, David Bix, or Indiana Jones, David Banner. Sorry. Yeah, it was de- yeah it's definitely like, it was definitely, a, he was definitely a hero on that one. Yeah, and uh, the supporting cast, were, I think, were pretty good. Um, speaking of which, at the end of this uh, chat here, Please stick around because I've got an interview with Lee DeBrew himself, who played Mike Evans in Escape from Los Santos. The bad cop. The, the bad cop with the moustache, yes. Yeah, um, nice moustache. Really, really. Yeah, very nice, very like proper, like, what they call them? Like handlebars. They use handlebars. I don't know. It's just really, really big and bushy. They go down like that, you know. Like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's big and bushy anyway. Hilarious, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Very funny. You know, when they used, you know, a bit like you remember the old Dick Dastardly, you know, he used to tw- tw- yes, twirly, twirly mustache. And double to that. <laughs> yes, yes. The oh cliche villain, yeah. Um, by the way, I used to love Dast- Dick Dastardly and Muttley. I loved wacky races and all that. It still made me laugh. Um, I love all that stuff. <laughs> it's just crazy. <laughs> um, that's childhood. See, that's going back to childhood again. Happy times, cartoons and Hulk and all that stuff that we had. You know, we used to have some great stuff. Um, so anyway, yeah, that was, the, that was Escape from Los Santos. As I say, stick around for the interview in a minute with Lee. Um, until then, guys, um, Sue and Alex, thank you very much for joining me on this one. Rawr! <laughs> and I'm delighted to have um, an actor who, who played um, the, the character, the lawman called Mike Evans. And it's none other, none other than Lee DeBrew. How are you, Lee? I'm good. Thank you. Thank you. You have been in uh, um, quite a few Western series, um, like The Virginian and Bonanza and so on. Can you tell us a little bit about, about working on those, those shows back then? Well, back then, we're talking about mid-60s. Um, of the Westerns that I did, um, I did about six gun smokes of note. Oh, yeah. And during those days, when you worked with a director and they liked your work, they kind of brought you along, which was really, really nice. And uh, I got to start back in 66 in a film called The Return of the Gun Gunslinger or Gunfighter with Robert Taylor at the time he was the last 
uh, under contract to MGM. So I got to go and work uh, my first job in July of 1966, professionally, uh, at MGM. And actually, the first time I ever stepped on the board was back in the, my college days at uh, Valley College. And in, here in the San Fernando Valley, outside of Los Angeles, and that was in 1964, and uh, two years later I had my first professional job. I did um, quite a few of those early television shows, but I got a leg up on a film called Tell Em Willie Boys here with Robert Blake and uh, Robert Redford at Universal, and that was uh, quite exciting for me. And uh, it was a big picture, and uh, I don't know, there's close to uh, in numbers of credits. I've worked with Paul Newman, I've worked with Robert Redford, I have worked with Sally Field in two films, uh, Norma Ray for one, I did Chinatown. Uh, my credits are, are varied and vast. Um, I think that over the period of time I've been uh, professional, I've done close to 200 different films and television shows. Wow. Um, yeah. And uh, then along with that, doing plays in the theater. When I left uh, college, I went to a small uh, company called the Company of Angels that had been founded by Richard Chamberlain, and this was in Hollywood. And these were the days that we could only do 12 plays because uh, 12, you know, a 12 day run of a play because equity had a tight squeeze on us. But that changed uh, up around 1971 or 72. My first love is theater. Yeah. You know, I. When I, when I read the newspaper and I go to the arts and entertainment section, uh, even if I'm not in a production, uh, there's a critic here by the name of Charles Chaplin who uh, writes uh, about theater and critiques theater. And he's a terrific writer. I don't agree with him all the time, but he does know how to put words together. So I enjoy his writing. Um, I just finished a movie uh, called Three with a wonderful actor by the name of Tom Bauer. And uh, it's a senior love story, actually. The Tom Bauer character uh, has a, a menage a trois. And uh, I try to uh, disrupt that man. Seems to be my uh, calling in my lifetime as an actor is to be the disruptive force <laughs> uh, <laughs> and uh, usually uh, present a, uh, uh, an obstacle for the, our hero and then wind up making our hero look even better by the ability to, you know, shoot a right cross and knock me out. So this doesn't change. <laughs> it happens as I'm coming on to his lady love uh, he calls me out, and I don't even get a chance to get up out of my chair, and he cold talks me. Uh -huh. We have high hopes of this film. Yeah. Um, Kelly Blatz is a young actor and a director. He's about 30 years old. And, um, yeah, it was a young crew, which was wonderful, and very, uh, in terms of ethnicity, uh, were very good. We had a a Japanese cameraman, uh, partially Japanese crew, it was shot in uh, digital and not 35 millimeter. So it it really moves along, and uh, you know it's, it's you don't need to have as large a crew. And with digital, you can actually, if you care to, um, edit in the camera as you're moving along. Yes, that's right. Yeah, yeah. Speeds things up much more than the film does. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Did you shoot that in California, Lee? Yeah, um, in Alhambra, which is another city outside of Los Angeles, 
uh, city proper. Alhambra is uh, east of Los Angeles. Uh, it's, it's so interesting. Um, going to a part of the town that I'm not that familiar with, it always seems as though um, it's, a, it's like a little mini vacation. Uh, some of the architects are different, the street names are different. Uh, how the, you know, as Los Angeles was settled, it was settled from the east uh, to the west. So a lot of places were settled before uh, the environment of downtown LA was built out and became the big city that it is. It was that, a matter of fact, it was in the convent we shot that was founded by a group of nuns from Montreal. <laughs> I think it was after the Civil War. Yeah. So it was a beautiful piece of property. Um, and the film has got some wonderful people in it. Oh, that's great. So, is it, so you've, that's all been shot. So when do you expect that to be released, do you think? You know, I really don't know. <clears throat> their, their hope is high. So they're looking to perhaps get it at next year's Suntance Festival. Yeah. Uh, those are the kinds of things that it's, it's trying to accomplish. This film was based on a photo by a photojournalist who followed the actual people, uh, got permission to, you know, kind of trail along and shoot their life in still photography and wound up then turning it into a screenplay and that's what they did that's great Lee I, I, I wish it all the best and I hope it does get you know to be seen on at the, at the film Thank festivals you. and so on and hope, I hope it does well you know I was going to talk to you first about Chinatown um, oh, Chinatown yeah okay and I want to know your, your, right. your thoughts on that and uh, your memories of working on that film because that did exceptionally well as we know um well, a friend of mine just recently, um, Rob Word, on, if you go to my Facebook page, you can see what he did. He did an interview with me uh, at a gathering that he has uh, on a monthly basis at the Gene Autry Theater. And it began the interview on Red Badge of Courage, which I did in 1974. He wanted to talk about the Civil War. and. It segued itself into a conversation about uh, what my experience was on Chinatown. And so you're asking me basically the same thing. <laughs> so I'll, I'll try to be uh, as succinct as possible. First of all, um, I met Polanski. Uh, they drove a group of us out uh, to an orange grove in, uh, I guess it was the West San Fernando Valley when there were still orange groves out there and met Polanski. Uh, you know, it was like he looked at us and uh, took a couple of Polaroid, which is instant uh, pictures. And I, I guess I must have, you know, heard from my agent probably a week after that. And I had just finished doing uh, a film with Bob Mulligan called The Nickel Ride prior to this, and the casting director uh, was the caster, had casting director for uh, Chinatown. He was also the casting director for The Nickel Ride. And um, I had quite a nice part, and uh, I had a great deal of uh, trust given to me by Bob uh, Robert Mulligan. I don't know. Are you familiar with Robert Mulligan? No, I am. I'm not Lee. No. Okay. Well, Robert Mulligan directed um, summer of summer of forty. The summer of forty. I think it was the summer of forty two. Yeah, that was it. He also uh, directed why I'm driving a blank on this, uh, the Gregory Peck, Peck film about uh, To Kill a Mockingbird. Oh, yes, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, and 
so he had chosen uh, we coming out of the theater Victor French who was also in the Nickel Wright uh, brought a group of actors together who had worked in the theater together to meet Mulligan and because Mulligan wanted this neighborhood feeling of these guys in the bar and anyway to make a long story short we were cast um, and uh, one of the uh, guys who was going to work with me in a scene uh, that Bob wrote the scene uh, for me because he needed some exposition explaining what this term what the the, the block was and um, the guy got sick and Mulligan called me and was in a, a panic uh, and he just said to me can you get me an actor well I I knew lots of actors and this one particular actor Tony Carbone uh, on my word Mulligan uh, took Tony Carbone's uh, my recommendation and Tony and I did the scene so what does this have to do with Chinatown right yeah. What it has to do is that uh, as a young actor, I think I was 32, I was feeling pretty uh, confident, to say the least. And so the, the you know, I got caught, cast in the, in the film. Uh, I, I, I liked the role because I was going to get to have a fight with Jack Nicholson. So I said, okay, that's going to be good. That'll be camera. Again, you know, I'm a disruptive force. And... Uh, so the hero gets a popping one. <laughs> so we shot a, the sequence as often will happen backwards. So in the scene in which uh, Nicholson's character Getty takes us and shows us uh, where the water is being run off uh, into the ocean, uh, there are three cops, or maybe four. I happen to be one in uniform. And um, Perry Lopez, Jack Nicholson, and uh, Dick Bacallion. Now, I was actually just off of, you know, a set. I was upstage at them. And so I was just playing my moment, taking off my hat and wiping my brow and doing all kinds of stuff like that within the scene, not pulling the focus. And um, when we set up, I'm thinking, I'm looking at this dribble of water coming out. This is the climax of the film. And I laugh. I just give a ha-ha kind of laugh. And Polanski just let me do pretty much what I wanted back upstage of the other actors. So as the scene ended, and Nicholson is standing with his back to the ocean, and I've got a, uh, I'm being let out basically by the two other actors. Uh, Jack had that bandage on his nose, yeah. so I'm thinking, well, he had, I had a scuffle, so I went by him and kind of did a thing on my nose with, uh, you know, like thumbing my nose with my index finger, saying, keeping your nose out of other people's business and this wouldn't happen. So <clears throat> what happened was that Nicholson got this take, and it's, you know, uh, in the film, and I have no line. So I'm expecting, when we go in to shoot the interior, that I was going to have the scuffle with Jack. But Polanski decided that it was more within the logic of the film to have either Dick Battalion, and that's what it turned out, and or Perry Lopez to uh, have the scuffle. That's where Diana Lane is laying on the floor. So I boldly made a suggestion about coming in behind Jack with a flashlight or a torch, as you call it there in England, and um, blind him and also get a big glare off of the, off of the, uh, the, the flashlight into the camera lens, which is kind of startling. Well, you have to understand, I am feeling very confident for me to do any of that, okay? Mm -hmm. And um, I, some people might call it arrogant, but I just felt because of my background and just having finished three or four films and with Bob Mulligan, there's a kind of respect that goes on and 
the things that I was able to bring to the Mulligan film, I felt, okay, great, I'm feeling pretty, pretty confident. So I said to him, look, wouldn't it be cool if we uh, did that shot that I just described to you? He said, yeah, but we'll give it to Battalion and uh, Perry Lopez and they'll be in the bathroom. And so when Jack opens the bathroom door as he gingerly steps across the body, the flashlight comes up and uh, flashes in the eyes of Perry Lopez. And I think that Jack says something like, hello, Gettys. And that was the scene. And we come back into the kitchen. Well, I, I cackle again. I make a laugh. And, um, you know, then we exit the scene and that's it. About, uh, oh, I don't know, the following year, I get a call from a friend of mine who says to me, do you know you're in Mad Comic Book? Frank, do you know what Mad Comic Book is? I do, yes, yeah, yeah I, I, I know that, yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. Well, I said, what are you talking about? He said, they did a satire called China Clown. <laughs> Clown. <laughs> and you're in one of those... Um, what are they called, cells. And I said, really? And I went out and I looked, and sure enough, there's that cop <laughs> behind Perry Lopez and Jack Nicholson. So I always have to say as an addendum to this story is that you don't know many people who wound up in... <laughs> in Mad Magazine, though. <laughs> <laughs> but on that page in Facebook, you can see it. It's, it, it's there. So, Frank, if you've not taken a look... I would, I would say go ahead and take a look at it. It's uh, pretty funny. But one more question about else? one more question about Chinatown before we go on to the Holtley of Roman Polanski. Um, in back in the day when you worked with him, how did you find him as a direct? How did you find him as a director? Well, I thought you know he, he gave you know if you're prepared as an actor when you come on the set, um, and it. You know, this is this was not a, I would say a key role. I was I, so there wasn't a lot of conversation with him. But I, I certainly felt as though he gave me an opportunity to do what I came with. And uh, I I don't know if we, you know, he would say something, don't you know, a little something aside. I'm sure he had more conversations with Jack. There was an interesting kind of competitive camaraderie with Jack and which seemed to be uh, you know more appropriate uh, he was easy to get along with you know if you did your work and I found this to be with almost every director I've ever worked with if you know what you're doing when you come on the set uh, you'll get your opportunity to be seen or not you know it depends on what they want with the camera um so Polanski wasn't like a, a you know, a, a puppeteer. Uh, he, he knew what he wanted in terms of, he was knew what he wanted, but he also knew that the actors were artists as well, including somebody like me at that, you know, with that, that kind of role. And I just brought what I could and he accepted it. I mean, the fact of that scene down on the beach, I'm upstaging everybody with a white handkerchief. <laughs> wiping my brow yeah. inside of my hat you know hey over here <laughs> you know upstage of everybody yeah. and he never got in my face about it he never said a word never that's interesting yeah yeah I, I, I just think that he sees a bigger picture I think that's what it is so any element in the film and I think that's what makes a great filmmaker that that it seems to be spontaneous um, don't leave it in there. Yes, you can, you know, from a master, you always can come inside that shot and wind up with the, the master just being entrance and exit. So, you know, and he comes in and he punches in for his close-ups or his two shots or whatever that he fancies for that particular moment. Yeah. Yeah. I worked with a great uh, director of photography on that, John Alonzo, Academy Award winner. I had worked with John on a couple of other things and other features, and 
he was wonderful, John Alonzo. And so much of what happens uh, on a film is that uh, marriage between a director of photography and his DP. Absolutely, also, yes. You know, I mean, mm. when, it, when it comes off, when a film comes off, there's a lot of moving parts that come together, and it's a beautiful thing to see. It's a beautiful thing to participate in. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, I agree. Um, uh, now, Lee, getting on to um, the, the, the Hulk story we're covering, which is um, your first appearance in the Hulk, it, and a story called um, Escape from Los Santos. Um, but that's what Shelley Fabre in it, right? That's right. And again, you play a lawman in that, too, as well, uh, uh, yeah. called Mike Evans. Uh, um, mm -hmm. And um, yes, yeah, 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 big, reasonable sized cast in it um, for that one. Um, mm -hmm. So, first of all, um, how did you get cast in it? What did you have to do? Was it just a general kind of well, an audition there thing? Time, and there was a time, and just recently in my career, in which I would just be recommend. They asked for me. Ah, right. Let's say we'd like Lee to brew in this role. And so I would negotiate with my agents, and I got the role. Um, at that time, I had done an awful lot of work at Universal. I'd done, at that time, I think I had starred in two uh, miniseries of three. I'd done um, work with Levins and Link. So I was known by the casting department there by this time. This was in the late 70s, I think. And um, so that's how it used to be. You'd work with a director in television <clears throat> or films, it's happened in both for me, where the, actor, the director would go to another television show and he would hire you. Today it's more all about the showrunners, the executive producers, and you've got 12 people, even if you've worked for one of them before, you got. 12 producers, and I'm exaggerating, of course, making the decision. Well, with the days that I started, the director would like your work, and, you know, you got along with the director. Uh, you pretty well moved, uh, your career was moved around along in those days. Yeah. It was, it was terrific. So, back to this, uh, I got along great with Shelley. We had a wonderful time, and then Elkar, I think, was in. Tom Huff, who is now deceased, we went to high school together and um, we played against each other in, in baseball. Uh, he doubled me. And what I remember about that particular episode was how big uh, Lou Ferrigno was. And he was able, I, he throws me over the hood of the car from the from the back to the front, right? Yes, that's right. And how he grabs me by the belt loops and picks me up was, that was 190 pounds. <laughs> picks me up with one hand and then kind of, I helped. But then Mike Huff comes in to take the, the shot over the top. I'm not quite sure how they did that. Over the top of the, the car, over the roof of the car. Yeah. Down onto the hood. <laughs> which I was doubled for, and then they cut in and made it look like I was getting dinged up for that. I think they used to when they used to do the throwing scenes. You know, you get the you get the shot where Lou grabs the person and then is alluding right. alluding to throw them. Then there's a cut. Then you see them propelling to the air. And I think they did a lot of that with a like a some kind of slingshot thing mechanism. You know, like like a pro well, propel them in the air. You know. They had mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I can't remember what they did. I do know, like, on RoboCop, when my character gets blown back by RoboCop or by my own men, yeah, they put a harness on me, and they also put the harness on the stunt double. And it's on a ratchet or, like, an a air jet or ramjet, and <laughs> you, you're taken for a ride, that's for sure. It shoots you off into the air. <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's probably like a big, it's a bit like a big catapult. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, I, the thing about it with Shelley, 
Um, you know, I've I've worked with actors that I kind of, as a kid, uh, and you know, she wasn't older than me at this time either, but saw her on the screen, and I was, you know, she was really lovely and a very, very sweet woman. And so she was uh, kind of open for teasing. Yeah, I love yeah. to do, which is kind of banter with her. Yeah, yeah. I was doing a good job of flirting with her. She was very sweet. Yeah. Um, you had you always had a, a, a well a, 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 certainly from the two Hulks episodes um, I've seen you in Lee you, you always had a kind of a cheeky smile on your face <laughs> a um, cheeky smile yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, like you know well, something I, we don't, don't it was <laughs> I had, a, I had a, a producer and casting director say to me they had come to see a play and saw me in it she said to me uh, Lee Stallmaster, the casting director, producer, and said to me, you know, no matter what you do, you always seem to have something going on in in your mind. Yeah. And I guess I do. So whatever the camera picks up, I'm fortunate that it likes me. Yeah. <laughs> It was. Always, it always seemed to me, especially in the second story, it always seemed to me like when you, you had that kind of grin on your face or something, or that kind of kind of like uh, um, I don't know, uh, um, kind of. I, don't, I can't really describe it, Raymond, but it always seemed like from the look on your face, it's like you know something that we don't. <laughs> Good. Well, it's, it's attractive. It makes you come in to see me. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. That means that, you know, I can stand absolutely stuck still and I'll be bemused. And, and I don't hide any of that stuff. I think that that really lo- is alive. I think whatever you see it as being, it's alive. Yeah. And that's really important. Oh, yeah. That's really. It's, it's certainly, yeah, very much so. Yeah. Yeah. Now, you, 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 um, from, from the opening, uh, uh, Part, but well, you were seen quite early in the episode, Lee. Um, apart from David, that you know, David Banner, um, where you you pick him up on as he's walking along the highway, um, you know. <laughs> and um, what, can you tell us about that? That that you know, those early scenes working with 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 Bill Bixby, and how you how you found him to work with. Well. It's so interesting and so sad at the same time. I had met Bill Bixby well before I thought of being an actor. Ah. And he was the the apartment next door neighbor of a girl that I knew. And I met Bixby probably in 1960. Wow. Um, Yeah. So he was establishing himself as a leading man at that time. And I was in the Navy. I was like, what, 19 at the time. So in that scene along the road that I pick him up, I, 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 I think I had done, and part of this was I did a, a miniseries or a movie of the week that he was in. And I can't remember the date, but it was the Johnson County War, which was a Western of sorts. And, excuse me. And in that scene, in the, he liked my work and he said said as much. He said to me something to the effect that, you know, you're, you're in this group, you're riding along, uh, you know, you're not paying too much attention to me because I'm part of a group. And he said, all of a sudden, boom, you're out there and you can't take your eyes off of you. That's what Bix said to me. Kind of like you're, you always have this grin on your face, this cheeky grin. <laughs> so I think he liked my work a lot. And I think that he was instrumental when my name was run by because he was executive producer on that show and with the director that was directing that particular episode, knew my work, and it all came together. That's brilliant. Yeah, that's brilliant to know that you, you, um, that you knew him, so, you know, way, way before you worked with him. 
you know. Right. He also, hunt. I don't know if I can use the F. F-bomb on your radio show? Yeah, sure. We, I do, usually, yeah. <laughs> well, he, he was the one that defined what fuck meant. <laughs> uh, he defined it as being uh, furrowing uh, the, the soil. Yeah. Or, yeah. And, you know, I was a wide-eyed 19-year-old. I thought, well, that's brilliant. And <laughs> because in the Navy... Uh, you use that word fuck in almost every sentence meaning a whole lot of different th- kinds of things. You could you could say in the Navy, well, oh, these fucking potatoes are great. Or you could say, fuck off. <laughs> or there's a whole uh, <laughs> Penelope yes. <laughs> of the word fuck as an adjective, adverb, verb, or even a noun. So, but you, you, um, so we, we, just getting back to that, to, to, uh, Lee, about the, that, that, that opening scene with with Bill along the highway. There right. we, was that shot close to Universal, or was that somewhere else? Um, can you remember? No, no, no. As a matter of fact, it was uh, shot um, in an area just, I would think, west end of uh, Newhall which is in the Santa Clarita Valley, uh, in an area that there were oil wells that had been dug early on. The first discoveries of oil in California were right in that area. Ah. And, it, yeah, and um, they're in Newhall. And, uh, yeah, he was walking along that, that road uh, when I picked him up. But we were just... You know, outside of Universal, we're probably 20, 30 miles from Universal. Right, and the scene—the scene I thought was really, really good, and because it was an early, an early um, kind of what they call Hulk out. That's what they call the the transformation scenes. You know, a Hulk out um, when mm-hmm. when Bill ch- changes to Lou um, was the, and I thought the cranking up of that tension in that cell scene was absolutely brilliant. You know where he's going in there, and he's been, and you know he's confused. He's been, he's been, uh, you know, taken in the car with you. Then he's like mm-hmm. ushered into um, the cell area, and then gets thrown into the cell. And he's obviously confused and going, "What, what the hell's happening here?" And and you got the, and then you got Shelley next in the cell next to him. It's mm-hmm. saying that you know he's being involved in this, in a murder. Uh, you know he's a murder suspect, and. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's just the tension in that scene is brilliant as he's getting, you know, obviously getting more mad and confused. You can feel it building to something, you know. And then you, mm-hmm. and then you turn and spray the mace in his face. <laughs> you know. Nice guy, huh? Yeah. So, uh, well, I just had to quiet him down. He was, he was just making too much of a fuss. Oh, he was getting out of hand, yeah, that's right. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, I thought if I sprayed him in the eye with with mace it uh, <laughs> it would it would cool jets as it were that, and obviously that didn't work <laughs> no it didn't <laughs> no no as a matter of fact it pissed him off I think <laughs> you didn't expect a green guy to come out and start you know wrecking the place <laughs> yeah I didn't expect that no, no. <laughs> who could expect that well yeah exactly it's not the sort of thing that would happen in everyday you know everyday life really <laughs> You know. I would think that it would scare you to death. <laughs> it, it, well, it would. It would but scare me to death. That, so, mm. you know, you, we play it absolutely dead earnest. I mean, you have to. You have there to. There isn't. Yeah. There isn't any. There's not a lot of humor. You're not making comments on on what's going on. You can't afford to do that. No, I think the moment you send it up, it's it, you've, you've you've killed it. Really, you have to play it straight. Absolutely. Really. Yeah, you know. Absolutely. Even if the, the even if the element that's in there is fantastical, you have to play it straight, you know. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and then and, and then it makes it more believable because of your reactions to it. You know, the audience are more the the, the audience are more involved, aren't they? You know. Yes. Yes, yeah. indeed. Um, so um, another actor you were with, who was quite an intriguing character on screen as well, was W. K. Stratton. Yeah, he became interesting. He and Don Belisario were very, very close friends. 
And W, where did we meet? I think we might have met, you know, I really can't, can't remember, but that's not important. He, Belisario, as you know, was the producer of Magnum P.I. I think that W.K. had worked on one. I did three, and that's when you could do such a thing, different Magnums, mm. including the um, first episode after the, after the pilot, after there was a strike in 1980. Tom was left in Hawaii without a, basically broke, waiting for the strike to get over. All the rest of its history. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. <and> broke. <laughs> yeah. And Tom, and Tom and I knew each other from college and with my brother. You know, it's, it's so strange what a small town. We all went to school together um, and uh, wind up uh, working with Tom on four different occasions. Uh, yeah, interesting, huh? It is. It is it, the way that the way the, the the industry works like that. Yeah, you see the you seem to sort but of. But it's not about going to parties and meeting and doing that kind of thing. It just happened to be that uh, timing and my work was good, and so that gives the producers and directors um, a, a little bit of a leg up that they can be confident in the actor that they've hired, which I'm glad to hear. <laughs> yeah. Th those scenes at the end of the story, Lee, um, what do you remember about that part? You know the bit where uh, you're giving chase to uh, to, to Bill and uh, Shelley on the, on the, on the, uh, uh, um, the, the, the bridge that's, you know, the, the bridge over the mountain uh, the, 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 uh, with the ropes on it, and you had to pretend... To be like walking across it with the other guys, you know, and it's and it's wobbling, wobbling, and everything. And <laughs> what happens? I, you know, I actually don't remember what happened. It was only forty years ago. Oh yeah, yeah, it was only yesterday. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. So what happens on the bridge? You, there's a bit where uh, um, uh, um, Bill and Shelley. Uh, are getting to one one side. They have to go across this kind of warp bridge, you know, like those um, the wooden ones with the ropes on, or the, you know, and uh, right. they they um, you are you are following them, you know. So they're trapped either side, if you know what I mean. They've got police one side and you coming across the other side, and um, and Shelley um, collapses through one of the part of the bridge it gives way and she goes down and he's trying to hold her you know so obviously it, it causes a change again in him um, and when the Hulk arrives he he, sh he shakes the um, the foundations of the of the uh, uh, um, uh, bridge that you're on so you're you're in you're all like rocking back and forth <laughs> You know, trying trying to hold on for dear life, and it just it was quite it was quite amusing actually. But uh, you know, I I don't have any recollection of that at all. I'm trying to picture it. <clears throat> I don't know. Maybe I was so scared to death that I just blanked it out of my mind. <laughs> I, I'm trying to remember where that where that took place. Do you recall if the director was Charlie Dubin? That it was um, it uh, was directed by uh, Chuck Bowman. Chuck Bowman. Yeah. Aha. Uh -huh. Now I'm trying to remember if Chuck Bowman, who went on to produce The Guns of Paradise, this may have been his first directing job. He, I know he directed a, a lot, quite a lot of Hulk stories. So you know, I know that much at least. Um, yeah, I, I'm trying to remember where he, I I did something with Chuck that was his first job as a director. He'd been writing, he'd been producing. Yes, this was his, which is like, uh, yeah, I worked with him again. So that was Chuck Bowman. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's about all I can remember from that. Um, although I, there was a moment that happened that was quite personal. 
um, just in terms of an actor's preparation. And, and when I'm pointing the gun at his head from outside the car, yeah, you know what I'm talking about? Yes, yeah, yeah. Well, I had been working with um, an acting coach for some time by this time. And in fact, John Voigt had worked with her as well. We were there at the same time, but at different times of the day. And I remember in a scene that we did in class in which she had me point a, a gun at somebody, and then she had me pronounce the Lord's Prayer as I was about to kill somebody. And I couldn't get through the Lord's Prayer, nor could I kill somebody. Mm-hmm. It was very meaningful to me. Um, and so I thought, it was fresh in my mind, that when I'm standing there with a gun drawn at a human being sitting there in a seat, I, I was just going to give it a ride with the Lord's Prayer again, internally. And it just made that focus, because I remember this, the focus in that scene even more intense than just holding up a gun. The idea of really shooting somebody, and I've done that on numerous occasions throughout my career, but this particular moment um, stood out in my own mind's eye. You may not have seen any different an audience, mm-hmm. but it did to me. Yeah. It did to me. Well, Lee, I, I'm so grateful for your time today to talk about the Hulk and the other stuff that you've you've been involved with. It's been an absolute joy to speak to you. Well, thank you very much, Frank. I appreciate that. It's been great. Thank you so much. And um, I hope you guys also enjoyed it um, out there. Um, And we'll see you very soon with another Incredible Hulk Hulk podcast. Until then, take care.